in our previous lecture, we talked about uh, the whole matter of cultural relativity. And I told you that it would be one of the most controversial of the lectures that I would give during the course of this entire class. Now, we'll have other controversial things because that's the nature of anthropological inquiry. We're going we're gonna to question all kinds of things. But that was probably the most controversial. Tonight, on the other hand, we're going to be looking at anthropological theory. And this will probably be the most boring lecture that you'll have to put up with throughout the whole course. Uh, and that's, that's an inauspicious way to, uh, to start a, uh, a lecture. But a lot of folk are not really interested in anthropological theory. As a matter of fact, one of the other professors around the place that teaches cultural anthropology completely skips this chapter, thinking that it's so boring. Would rather get on to more exciting things like, like um, women in culture. You know who the other anthropologist is now, don't you? <laughs> a woman, obviously. So uh, anyway, I think it's important. And for that reason, I stick with this, even though I know that for some of you it's going to be, oh, pain and agony. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to be a groaner for you. But it's important because, you see, if you were to take this course from a state university with a professor who was not a believer, he would be sharing with you the theoretical perspective of the discipline. And uh, it would be a very compelling kind of a theoretical perspective, you wouldn't have the opportunity to stop and reflect upon it as a Christian might reflect on anthropological theory. And one of the things that we want to do is to stop and reflect on these various theories. We're going to be looking at six different theories. We're going to be looking at the whole discipline. And as we look at the disciplines, we look at the theoretical basis, we're going to get a chance to see what it means to be an evangelical, to be a Christian in the academic world and to be able to take the kinds of things that academic minds uh, are, are inquiring about and what they're examining and to be able to bring to it a special perspective that of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so our goal tonight will be to, to bring some Christian reflection on the topic and I want you to have a part of that and perhaps even get excited about it and hopefully Hopefully, if you get excited about it, you will want to take a course in anthropological theory from an evangelical perspective. And we are right in the process now of actually developing the first major textbook on this subject, uh, and evangelical perspectives on anthropological theory. And we're bringing together a group of very renowned Christian evangelical anthropologists, and and we're. Uh, we're going to uh, have a major conference here at Biola, uh, hopefully sometime next year, in which we'll talk about this and uh, have a chance to, uh, to reflect on it uh, in depth, put it into some, into some uh, printed form, and then uh, distribute it as I, what I believe will become a major textbook in the whole field. So tonight, anthropological theory. And our whole subject is going to bring us bring us, there we go, um, into a discussion of four major points for our topic tonight. We're going to talk about the goal of anthropological inquiry. We're going to talk about six theoretical um, research questions. We're going to talk about six theoretical approaches. And then we want to conclude with an evangelical perspective. So that's going to be our uh, outline of the next two hours together. And hopefully, in the process of it all, we will come up to a, um, a sharper ability to read our text and to understand exactly what it is that the author is trying to portray for us. Well, let's talk about the goal of anthropological inquiry. And when it comes to anthropology, quite frankly, anthropologists have five major questions that they need to answer. Five major questions that anthropologists have to answer as they come to a study of culture. And the first question that they must ask is, what do people do? I mean, that's fairly simple, but you know, that's not quite as simple as it sounds, because 
basically what we need here is a as an approach that will systematically lead us through asking what do people do you see tourist casual observers ask all kinds of questions about what do people do but because they're not asking it in a systematic manner they tend to get random kinds of answers and they tend to come up with uh, imperfect responses so Marco Polo takes off and heads to China and he writes up all of the interesting fascinating things that he discovered there well did he really travel to China his notes are so uh, such a mixture of uh, of stuff that there is a serious question as to whether he actually traveled to China or whether he just lifted a lot of his ideas uh, it's a very imperfect view of China in the days of Marco Polo and a lot of folk have gone to cultures and come back with strange reports and quite frankly one of the tasks that that anthropologists have set themselves to doing is to trying to figure out whether the things that people are reported to be doing are really what they do for instance do Eskimos really rub noses instead of kissing when they greet one another mm -hmm. okay. well the answer is no they don't see Eskimos don't rub noses when they greet one another that was uh, that was a uh, a story that a traveler to uh, to uh, the uh, uh, polar regions invented he wanted to sell books about his travels and so he made up all kinds of stuff and this was not at all uncommon for adventurers to do <laughs> stretch the truth and so they told about these cute little practices of the uh, Eskimos rubbing noses and uh, folk were fascinated by it well uh, anthropologists have long since discovered that it's not true the, uh, another question do cannibals really eat people now there's a there's a very famous anthropologist who has questioned the whole practice of people eating people and said you know what I cannot find one verifiable uh, substantiated uh, study where there is good proof that people eat people he said I believe it's all a myth well do cannibals eat people and are there really such things as cannibals well he's been taken to task a lot of folk have risen to the challenge and have begun to answer him I've been among people who claim to eat people I've been with cannibals I've interviewed them talked at length with them I'm convinced cannibals do eat people that there are such a thing as cannibals I have no reason to doubt my data my problem is is I would not be able to defend my experiences with the experience or with the requirements of this anthropologist because the evidence that he demands is that somebody neutral observer like a trained anthropologist has to actually sit there and see them brain somebody roast them and then put it down that would constitute evidence well unfortunately if you happen to be in that kind of company it's probably you that's going into the pot and uh, you know there's not an awful lot of good evidence for uh, that comes out of that kind of stuff but whatever the case may be what do people do that's the first thing we've got to have some accurate reporting some systematic reporting and anthropologists have set themselves to doing that kind of accurate reporting the second question that we have to ask is are there patterns to what people do do they fall into into uh, familiar life ways and do those familiar life ways tend to fall into certain kinds of categories so much so that you could say ah yes that pattern of behavior is typical of a people who have diffuse leadership or that pattern of behavior is typical of a culture in which there is a rigid hierarchy of leadership or of of uh, male chauvinism or male dominance are there kinds of patterns that flow under certain kinds of behavioral conditions and what is the correlation to this and if there is a correlation 
we have to ask ourselves, are there certain cultures that demonstrate patterns? For instance, a number of years ago, in an earlier generation, anthropologists tried to set up uh, cultural personalities. And so they looked at uh, Japanese culture and said, oh my goodness, one of the characteristics of Japanese culture is that they're very rigid and very, uh, 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 very uh, uh, obedient kind of people and uh, almost fanatical and, and it's all as a result of, uh, of too severe a potty training. And so they tried to come up with a Japanese personality style. And they did the same thing with uh, German style of living and British style of living and American style of living. And as a matter of fact, it was out of these kinds of observations, very unscientific observations, but anthropologists had to pick them up, look at them in great depth, try to come up with some conclusions as to whether there was any scientific validity. But one of, the, one of the things that emerges in this kind of, of an approach is what we call stereotyping. And if any of you have ever uh, seen the TV series, or perhaps you grew up watching this TV series, uh, Hogan's Heroes? You remember Hogan's Heroes? Uh, Hogan's Heroes was built on uh, ethnic stereotyping. There was the, you know, the freewheeling American, there was the very rigid British staff officer who had to have his tea every day, and then of course there was Schultz, you know, the German. And, and the, whole, the whole series was built on stereotyping. And uh, the question was, are, is there any truth to stereotyping? Well, anthropologists have looked into this, and the culture and personality studies have long since been abandoned. We've discovered that there are people from all different kinds of personality traits in various cultures, and yet there is enough truth to it to warrant some serious investigation. And uh, this continues to be a major theme. For instance, uh, uh, Carl Heider and a, his wife came out to Irian Jaya to look at child rearing practices. Child rearing practices became a very, a very uh, famous part of this whole approach. Uh, came out to study child rearing practices, and one of the things they discovered was that in the Grand Valley, Donnie, the Grand Valley Donnie, the children were always carried in their net bags on the women's backs, and they were very seldom allowed out of the, the net bags, and so there they were, uh, bound up in these net bags. In contrast to the Western Donnie, where the parents tended to carry their children on their shoulders, and the kids would have to hold on to mom or dad's hair, and if they let go, I mean, they'd be flopping all over the place. And so the kids became much more uh, aggressive in terms of, of learning to hold on and take care of themselves and, and not be flopped all around the place. And they postulated the possibility that, that, the, that the two cultures, Western Donnie and Grand Valley Donnie, would, would become very different as a consequence of the different child ring techniques in which some of the children were bound up and unable to express themselves and in another in which they had to in order to survive. Kind of an interesting theory. It would have been nice to have followed it through with more studies. But uh, are there patterns to what people do? The next question we have to ask ourselves is why do people do what they do? Why do people do? And one of the points that we're going to have to take into consideration here is the fact that we, who are believers, are convinced that, that God made us creatures and designed us with a sense of purpose and meaning in life. And that life must have purpose and meaning for us. And so because we are meaningful creatures, we seek to engage in patterns of behavior that express that meaning and purpose. And, uh, and so you'll see, you'll see a young child, uh, three years of age maybe, uh, going for a walk or being with their parents, and uh, the parent will point something out. Look at that tree, it's, uh, it's uh, turning orange. And the first thing the child asks is, why? Well, I happen to have a grandson who a little bit older than now, but when he was three, we were visiting, and so we took him for a walk in the park. And as we were going down the sidewalk, maybe a 15-minute walk, he must have asked me why uh, 15 or 20 times. Why, Grandpa? You know, why do worms live in the ground? 
Why do they come out when it rains? Why do raindrops bounce? Why this? Why that? I mean, everything was a why. He was constantly trying to find out what his world was like. Why does the world function as it does? Why do people do what they do? Why did that man drive too fast? Why did he go through the stop sign? Why did somebody toot their horn? He wanted why answers to all of his why questions. Uh, Proverbially, I mean, I was so tired of answering why questions when I came back. I was exhausted. But he's trying to make sense of his world. And, and as human beings, we are this way. And anthropologists have to become like a three-year-old child, literally. Why? Why are you doing it that way? Why would you do that? What's up? And uh, you, you learn to make a pest of yourself, actually, as an anthropologist. Uh, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, what causes differences? in what people do. What causes folk to, to, dis, to uh, experiment with different approaches to solving the same kinds of problems? We all have to eat. But why do some people eat three times a day and some people eat twice a day. Is there a reason? Why do some people eat with spoons and forks and others with chopsticks? Even the way in which we go to the bathroom. We have a different stance, a different posture than tribal people. We have different ways of, uh, of motion. Some cultures have an up and down motion. And so everything they try to do, they try to do with an up and down motion. Others have a circular motion. And one of the things we discovered was when we tried to get folk who are, who are used to an up and down motion to do a circular motion, oh, they say, oh, my arm gets so tired doing this. They're just not used to the, to the pure mechanics of going circular when they're used to an up and down motion or a back and forth motion. Why do these differences pop into similar ways of solving problems? And it, uh, perhaps out of this, see, we will begin to discover something significant about our cultures. And then the last question that anthropologists will want to ask is, why do people change what they do? Why do people change what they do? In other words, we have to understand culture change, the whole process of culture change. Now, the goal of anthropology, of anthropological inquiry, is to somehow or another answer these five questions. See, what do people do? A good ethnography will explain or will describe what people do in terms of patterns. Patterns will attempt to, to draw together certain kinds of groups, groupings of uh, behaviors that are typical of a culture. And then an explanation of why people are doing that. And then, then if we can get down to the question of differentiation, see, then we can start to sort out why it is that people do what they do. And we can then move on to the next question. What about change? Can we explain change? Can we explain people's resistance to change? Because some people don't want to change. So culture change. Now, it, having asked all of those questions, we, we really have only established the very broadest parameters of what it is that we want to look at. We really still need to focus uh, much more specifically on our discipline. And so we move now to six research questions that uh, are going to help us to get the data that we're looking for. And one of those research questions that we're going to ask is, what is the role of biology and genetics in determining human behavior? Do people behave the way they do because of the genes in their system? because of their biological inheritance, or do they do what they do on the basis of cultural conditioning? 
This is, a, uh, this is an issue that is uh, uh, being picked up by all kinds of scientific disciplines. It's being picked up by biologists. It's being picked up by psychologists. Whether you are behavioralist in the psychological field or whether you are a, uh, uh, a biologist looking for the biological basis of behavior. Let me give you an example. The question has been raised, are certain people prone to criminal behavior as a consequence of biology? Do they have a violent gene up here in the old brain? So they went to a prison and they, uh, they asked for some volunteers took some of the most violent offenders and began to do uh, brainwave studies and uh, examination of, uh, of the uh, uh, biology of their brain. And do you know what they discovered? That there is a significant biological difference in the brains of violent criminals. And so that raised the whole question. Are some people more prone to violence as a result of what they were born with, their genetic predisposition. So, when it comes time to sentence somebody, you have just uh, murdered six people. You're going to jail for the rest of your life. Does the <coughs> criminal then say, but judge, you don't understand. I had this horrible mother and my father, I don't even know who he was. And I, you know, I've got this the horrible background that uh, predisposed me to criminal behaviors. Can't you take into consideration my horrible background and give me a little leniency? I mean, is that the route he ought to be going to plead for leniency? Or have we got a better one now? Well, but judge, you don't understand. See, I've got this brain. See, I, I'm, I'm only doing what comes naturally to me. See, you've got to give me leniency because I couldn't help it. Are we the product of culture? Are we the product of biology? And this is a controversy that's not going to go away. It's a controversy that is being accelerated, as a matter of fact, by the homosexual community who are saying, look, my homosexual uh, lifestyle is the product of my genetic inheritance. God made me homosexual. So, how can you challenge that? If God made me this way, if I was born like this, then I can't change. Or do we ascribe to them the fact that, hey, you know, you've uh, probably had some kind of a trauma, dad beat you up, therefore you got to hating mother for not protecting you against dad, therefore you are fixated on other men and you, you know, or whatever. Or, do we take the moral approach that says, hey, whatever, whether your parents beat you up or whether you were born with it, you have to make moral choices as a moral creature and uh, you are held accountable on the basis of moral uh, responsibility. See, these, are, these are the competing theories. Now, whatever those theories lead us to, one of the things that anthropologists are setting themselves to do is to look at the role as much as I can to at least come up with a database that allows us to understand what is the role of biology and what is the role of culture. A second research question that must be asked is, what is the role of ecology in the development of human behavior? What is the role of ecology? Does our environment change the manner in which we organize our behaviors, in which we organize our social structure. Life, for instance, in dispersed bands, we'll talk about that in, in a couple of weeks, where people live in small bands and they wander all around looking for food. The kind of culture that you find in Australia among the Aborigines. Is there something distinct about what happens here that is ecologically conditioned? Well, quite obviously there is. 
But as part of that whole ecological adaptation, see, are there other factors that are playing a role here? See, in respect to, uh, to the kinds of foods that they're taking in, to the kinds of responses that they're having. Uh, for instance, there was, uh, there's been uh, some uh, real serious questioning as to whether the early Egyptians weren't getting too much mercury in their diet that was causing them to have certain kinds of weird behavior patterns back in the days of the pharaohs from drinking from uh, clay mugs that hadn't been properly uh, uh, fired in kilns and so the uh, chemicals were leaking into their drink and they were drinking mercury poisoning into their system. Well, uh, what can we find out about the relationship between ecology and human behaviors? What is the relationship and uh, to what extent should that become a, an important part of our research strategies? So we look at ecology. We look at biology. And then a third question that we have to ask is, what are the driving forces of human nature that most powerfully determine the patterns of human behavior? What are the driving forces that influence patterns of behavior? These are, uh, these are questions that really get us deep into the theology of human nature. Do we have free will? What is it that uh, prompts us to uh, go about setting our values and our life ways and establishing relationships to other human beings. What is the driving force? Is it, is it a spiritual hunger that is driving us? Or is it simply a biological urge? And we're going to pick up on this toward the end of the lecture when we talk about social biology. And we're going to be listening to, uh, to a description of how sociobiologists are saying the primary driving force of cultural behavior is the urge to reproduce. In other words, the reproduction of our own kind is the thing that drives society. Now, there are anthropologists who would seriously disagree with that and say, absolutely not. It's not reproduction at all. It's power. Power is what drives us. People want power. And organ so all of society is organized around a drive for power, for authority, and that is what we must look at as being the driving force for human organization and social systems. Well, we're going to look at these various theories and we're going to have to come up with some reasonable answers. The fourth question that we want to ask as we think of doing uh, anthropological research is this question, how can we ascertain that the information necessary for answering these questions and is it possible to get the correct information. We really need to be uh, self-reflective on our own discipline. Is it really possible to understand uh, why people engage in the kinds of behaviors that they engage in? I can ask you, why did you do that? And you know what? Probably you don't know why you did it. It's just the way we do it. As a matter of fact, you weren't even aware that you were doing it differently until someone came along and did it differently. <laughs> I, I give you an example. I, uh, I don't know where I learned this, but in, in growing up, if I would get a, a nick or a cut on my finger, you know, my first reaction is to, mm, boy, that's smart, you know, and put it up and, and lick the blood off. Now, I don't, you probably don't. I mean, it's probably a stupid, filthy habit that I picked up on the gutters of the uh, urban area that I grew but that's that's I've always done that and I never even thought about how silly that was until I got into Donny culture and uh, all of a sudden I did that and three people got sick I mean just see me because when they cut themselves they, they do this kind of thing they're snapping that you know oh gee you know and they're, they're snapping the blood off and here I am 
licking it off. And the very thought that someone would drink their own blood absolutely nauseated them. <laughs> Well, I had never thought about it. Well, I had to, you know, from then on, I started learning to put pressure on, which is probably what you've learned to do, you know, instead of sucking it off, you know, putting pressure on it. Well, why, do, why did I do that? I, never, I didn't know I did it. I couldn't give you an answer for it. And if an anthropologist had come along and asked me, why do you do that? I might have made an answer up. Uh, I might have said, I don't know. And the question that's being raised is, do we have the theoretical tools see, for finding what people do and why they do it and to be able to come up with appropriate information? And this raises a question then, is anthropology a science or is it an art form? And in this question, see, there are, uh, there are uh, scientists who say no, because you cannot duplicate the results of your work. You cannot get people to do the same kind of behavior over and over again with certainty. They will throw in a variation and that immediately ruins the ability to replicate, therefore it can't be scientific. Therefore you must interpret data. And if you interpret data, then it becomes a piece of art. Well, we're gonna look, we're gonna look at a scientific anthropological theory that takes this position. The fifth question, research question that we want to ask is, what makes human beings social creatures who are open to establishing rules and regulations upon their behavior? What makes us social creatures? Why do we enjoy the company of others? Why do we want to be in company with others? And why do we subject ourselves to all of the inane rules of our culture. Now, uh, for instance, I'm wearing a tie tonight. Now, I hate wearing ties. It is the most useless piece of clothing in my wardrobe. And yet every day I come to Biola wearing a tie. Why? Well, I can tell you why. I come every day with a tie because during my first year at Biola, I came without a tie. And one day as I was walking through the cafeteria, the provost motioned me over and said, Doug, are you aware that tenure around here is determined by who wears ties and doesn't wear ties? Now he was teasing. Uh, sort of. You know, how they tease. So ever since then, I've been wearing ties because I wanted tenure. See? Well, I also began to look around and notice, well, there are a few people who don't wear ties. Who, who, who on our faculty, no, not a name, you know, department, who on our faculty don't wear ties? Members of what department? Hmm? Art department. <laughs> Art department can get away with it. Yeah, they're bohemians. You know, they run around with sweatshirts and blobs of paint all over them, you know, that vacuous look in their eyes. You know, and so they, they can get away without wearing ties. See? Anybody else around here? Get away without wearing ties? Sociology. Right. You can get away with it in sociology. I mean, the soci they, I mean, they live in constant rebellion against society. You know, I, I'm a sociologist, but I don't have to live by the rules of my society. You know? And so they, you know, they, they're doing it in protest. And so we grant a few exceptions. See? Nobody else. Nobody else. Well, unless, unless it's the, the occasional mad scientist over there mixing things in the, in the lab and, and uh, you know, we'll let them sneak by. But, but folk around here wear ties. And the most conformist group, the folk on the other side of the campus, Talbot, <laughs> all got the same hair. Well, I know. We're, on, we're on camera, so they don't want to pick up. But, but why, do, why do I subject myself to wearing this dumb, stupid tie? Because Social pressures are on me. Well, what do they care about whether I wear a tie or not? Well, somehow or another, our society has come up with, with uh, standards and expectations. And we're expected to live by those standards and expectations. And we, we reward one another according to those expectations. We're going to talk about how very powerful that can be. And so uh, it's important to us to be accepted. And the question is why? What is it about human nature 
that causes us to be such social creatures and to subject ourselves to these regulations. And then we ask ourselves, to what extent are people able to transcend their cultural traditions or heritages? <clears throat> are we indeed locked into our cultures, never capable of transcending it, never capable of being something different. Let me give you an example of how we are locked into our <coughs> cultural traditions. I went off to uh, an outstation about three days journey from my home. I went off by myself, told my wife, look, I've got to go out to this outstation. Uh, we're going to be building a, uh, a clinic up there. We're going to be building a little uh, residence, a little uh, three-room house that my wife and, and children could come. We could live up there because, uh, frankly, three days walk up there uh, was a bit stressful. And we figured if we could put an airstrip in and we could land and then we could uh, fly in on occasionals, uh, visits. The whole family could come. We could spend a few days there, but I said, I'll have to go up and prepare the place. So, so I went up to build a, a small uh, place for us to live right outside the village and to build a small clinic and to begin then a ministry among this very, very distant uh, group of people in our tribal area. But in the meantime, I had to live in the men's house with the rest of the men. So every night I would sleep with 12 to 15 other men. And uh, I would wake up in the morning, there'd be 12 to 15 men, and by that time, a lot of young boys had come in, the place was just popping with people. You know. And so I would cook my breakfast over the fire uh, while they would all watch and, and uh, be amazed at uh, how anybody could stand to eat oatmeal in the morning. But I didn't particularly want to have sweet potatoes for breakfast, which is what they had, so I would fix a little bowl of oatmeal and uh, they would watch with uh, great delight. And then, uh, then I would put another pot on and I would heat up some water to make a couple of cups of coffee. And I would sit there and have a bowl of oatmeal and a cup of coffee in the morning. They were all fascinated and talking about it and, and, and wondering what it tasted like. And so I discovered that, that in order to be hospitable, it was appropriate to uh, make a little extra oatmeal, more than I could eat, and then pass the leftovers around. And they quickly discovered that oatmeal tastes Horrible. So uh, uh, they didn't want any more. But that, you know, we, we, but for two weeks now, I was living there with this group of people and had not a moment's privacy the whole time. And uh, the only time, the only time that you could, you could be alone was when you had to relieve yourself and you headed toward the privy. And they would, oh, 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 we can't go with them, you know. And all the people would back off. And they would wait, you know, 10 feet off of the little path down to the privy till I came out. Oh, here he comes, here he comes, you know, and we could talk some more. <laughs> well, uh, I loved it. I, we had the most marvelous time. We had a grand time with them. But, you know, I, I the end of that two-week period, I came down sick with malaria. And, and, oh, I was, I was in pain. I was hurting. High fever, uh, bone aching pain all over me, and my resistance went down, and I didn't have any, any uh, cure for it. And, oh, man, I thought, oh, gee, I've got I've to wait five more days before the plane can come, and I had no way to, to make contact for, with the aircraft, and I couldn't walk home, and I didn't want them to carry me for three days. Oh, my goodness, with that fever, I, I'd have just as soon died. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to tough it out for five days. Well, I'm not a real tough guy, you know. Bone-breaking fevers, you know, sort of like having a bad case of the flu. And about day two, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty wiped out. And one of the uh, pastors came in from an outer village and he said, Hayward, he said, I've got some, some uh, pills for this. So he immediately gave me the pills and, oh, blessed relief. Within 24 hours, the pain was gone, the fever was broke, and I started to recover, only to discover that the plane was going to be three days late. And I'm out of food. I'm out of everything. I mean, I'm out of any kind of resource. I'm like, oh, no, three more days, I'm not going to make it. Well, a missionary from a, uh, another base heard that my plane was going to be delayed for three days because of a variety of factors. And so he immediately dispatched uh, a runner 
to bring me some extra food because he kind of figured I might be out of, out of uh, supplies. So by the end of that first day, when I'm really beginning to think, oh, man, I'm not going to make it, this guy shows up. And he's been, he's been uh, literally running for 12 hours. And he dropped off a bag of food, and he said, this is from missionary so-and-so. Figured you might need the food. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, There is a God, and he does love me, even though I'm going through the, all of this. So I finally got some, some nourishment and started to feel better. But you know, as I was recovering, it was a Sunday afternoon. For the first time, I was feeling human again. I was recovering. I was, my strength was coming back. And I turned on my radio, because I did have a, a, a shortwave radio, and I, while I couldn't broadcast her, uh, to anybody, I could listen to the radio, and the Voice of America came on. And when the Voice of America came on, here was an, a, a, an American talking. And I remember thinking, oh man, this is cool. And so I turned on the Voice of America, and I started listening, and all of a sudden, about 30 kids came gathering around, oh, listen, he's, he, what is it, what are you listening to? I said, I'm listening to the Voice of America. And they said, what's he saying? And you know what? All of a sudden, I did not want to talk to anybody. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to be just with my radio back in my culture. And I said, oh, he's talking about things that are not of interest to you. Oh, come on, tell it. No. And I picked up the radio and I said, you know what? I'm going for a walk. And they said, you're going for a walk? Where are you going? I said, I don't know, but I'm going all alone. And nobody's to come with me. And they said, nobody? I said, nope, I'm going all alone. They said, why? And I said, I just want to be alone. So I, I walked out the village carrying my radio. See? And, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I walked for about two hours. I just had to be alone. And it was at that point that it finally dawned on me. You know what? I've grown up in a culture in which I was allowed to be alone. I have developed a, a, a psychological and emotional uh, attitude toward life that allows me to be alone. And it's okay to be alone. As a matter of fact, not being alone had left me uptight. I was short. I was emotionally exhausted. And of course, it was all compounded with all the other stuff. But I needed some alone time. So for two hours, I walked alone. And when I came back, I sat down, I turned the radio back on to Voice of America, and I talked to them for three more days. We had a marvelous time. Once I had got my alone time filled up, I was okay again. And I discovered that people who grow up never being alone feel horrendously uncomfortable being alone. And people who have grown up learning to be alone feel crowded and uncomfortable when they can never get alone time. Now, I am the product, see, of my cultural heritage. Now, the next question is, see, can I ever transcend that? Could I ever become other than a loner and become more group-oriented? Well, uh, that became one of my objectives, see, to learn to be more comfortable in the constant presence of other people. And I discovered that there are certain limitations to what I can do and can't do. My culture has programmed me. And this is one of the things that cultural anthropology seeks to do. Well, we want to talk now. We want to move beyond the kinds of questions that anthropologists ask. And what we want to do is we want to move into the manner in which anthropologists have sought to organize their questions around certain kind of theoretical hypotheses. And we're going to look at such, six such theories in the time that is yet before us tonight. Six anthropological theoretical positions and the manner in which people have sought to answer the kinds of questions that we've talked about and to, and to resolve, to fulfill the goals of anthropological inquiry. And the first question the first anthropological theory we want to look at is known to us in the anthropological literature as unilineal evolutionary theory. And it was propounded back in the 19th century by a fellow by the name of Lewis Henry Morgan. Very early anthropologist. I won't go into the background of who he was. That's for another class, another time. But Lewis Henry Morgan came to the conclusion that Quite frankly, culture is the development uh, 
of people who have evolved from a very simple lifestyle up through successive stages until they have ultimately achieved the complex lifestyles that we know in modern day civilization. So he is applying to the development of culture the whole concept of evolutionary development that in some respects parallels biological evolution. You see, in the same way that mankind has evolved, according to biological evolution, from simple creatures to more complex creatures to finally human beings, so cultures have similarly evolved. Now, they went through a, a, a process of believing that it was kind of like a straight line upwards. And so, uh, uh, according to, to uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, you start out with a stage that he calls savagery. Savagery is the lowest level of social organization. It's the kind of life that you would find in deepest, darkest Africa. It's the kind of lifestyle that you would find among the Australian Aborigines. It's the kind of lifestyle that you would find with uh, people who have who have very few instruments of uh, clothing and very, very few tools or artifacts. Then, as you move progressively higher in social evolution, you move to the level of what he called barbarism. And in barbarism, you would have cultures in which uh, people have developed some levels of sophistication, using their terminology, you would have peoples like you would find in Southeast Asia or in India or in China where uh, they, uh, they have some semblance of, uh, of uh, cultural uh, development, but it's still pretty, pretty gross. These are people who, uh, who are still uh, far below the ultimate uh, uh, achievement of human society, which we know as civilization. And of course, the traits of civilization would be the traits that would be most generally found in the Western cultures of England, Germany, European powers. So uh, they tended to put each one of these cultures into uh, this strategy of development, unilineal development. But in order to make it a scientific experiment, because after all, this is the beginning now of scientific inquiry. And one of the things that Lewis Henry Morgan wanted to do was to put his theory into, into a theo theoretical perspective. So he said, if this is true, then there ought to be certain kinds of indications. Down there at the savage level, there should be certain uh, characteristics that, that flow with savagery that then move upwards into barbarism and that then move up into civilization. And as people begin to move, you can find then ways to measure the, uh, the progress. And so he picked four or five significant uh, measurement tools that would show this progress. And we want to talk about the, the uh, instruments that he chose. First of all, he picked tools as an indication of the level of sophistication of a particular culture. If they had flake stones for tools, you know what a flake stone is? Where they would take a, a stone and then take another stone and begin to, to knock on it, and they would knock off the larger chips until they had created a kind of a sharp edge on one side. And then with that flake stone, working as a stone knife, they could then uh, cut open an animal, they could skin it, they could, they could pull the... Uh, the marrow away from the bones. They could use this to facilitate their, uh, uh, their ability to uh, produce either simple gardens or they, they could use to uh, prepare their food. Well, that would be a level of, of uh, sa savagery, the simple use of stone tools. And the Donny culture, prior to our arrival would have been put at the level of savagery because they still had stone axes. They would take stones and they would, they would rub them against uh, other kinds of stones until they would polish them into, uh, into a nice uh, uh, sharp 
oval shape that they could then tie to a, uh, a, a, a notched uh, club handle, they could then bind it all down and make themselves a stone axe. But because that was the only tool that they had, stone axes or sharp sticks, they were down at the level of savages. Now, if you move up to barbarism, what kind of things do, uh, do uh, barbaric peoples have? Well, they have uh, bows and arrows. And uh, they have spears, and uh, they may have uh, some very sophisticated kinds of uh, of uh, bows and arrows. They could have they could have notched arrows. Uh, they could have the English longbow, would be an example of uh, of a stage of barbarism. Uh, they are beginning to develop uh, simple instruments. They would start to come up with uh, with uh, simple uh, plows. They would come up with the ability to uh, to uh, lead an animal around. Uh, they're starting to develop a greater ability to harness energy from uh, animals or from water power. They're starting to have buckets to carry things in. See, this is barbarism. But civilization, civilization. Uh, in civilization, we have nice refined clothes to keep us warm. We have, uh, we have very sophisticated tools like guns, knives, steel instruments, see. We have uh, mirrors, we have machinery, we start to have uh, 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 internal combustion engines, and on and on it goes. Well, uh, he tried to use tools then to show savagery, barbarism, civilization. There's just one problem. In a categorization, in a, in a series of, of, uh, of uh, this classification, where do you put the boomerang? This marvelously aerodynamically uh, sophisticated tool that the Australian Aborigines can use, and they can heave that thing, and it'll go out into a circle and go around behind a tree and knock that poor little old koala bear off of the tree and stun him and knock him to the ground so he can go pick it up and have dinner. And if he happens to miss the koala bear because it, it arches a little bit high, that boomerang will come right back to him. He can pick it up and try again, a little bit lower. See? And that thing will go up and go right around the tree and hit that old koala bear on the other side, knock him down. See? Koala bear thought he was so cool hiding. He didn't know about boomerangs. Now, a boomerang is a very sophisticated weapon. Now, is that a savage tool, barbaric tool, or is that something that belongs in civilization? All of a sudden, we're having to struggle a little bit with what is sophisticated and what isn't sophisticated. And how sophisticated are the Inuit who have learned to hunt for seals under the ice? And they have, they have learned to develop very, very sophisticated uh, techniques of putting uh, uh, markers over the blowholes where a uh, where a seal will come up and try to breathe uh, below the ice or a blowhole and uh, put a little uh, uh, marker there so that when when the seal breathes it will cause it to blow in the wind and also a marker that will indicate whether the the blowhole is to the right to the left or straight down, so that he will know whether to thrust this direction or this direction or straight down, because you see, he could miss the seal. A very sophisticated technology for determining how to hunt for an animal that he can't see. And of course, they had some very, very sophisticated uh, traps that they could use in, uh, even in a savage culture like the, the uh, like the Donny, they had uh, 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 pig traps see, in which they would they would they would have uh, uh, sticks stuck in, leading down in a triangle shape until it would finally lead a wild pig that they would be trying to, to try to get into the trap until they could get that pig kind of down into a very narrow little little uh, place. And that narrow little place would actually be loaded up with all kinds of food. And that food would all be entangled with a vine that when it was uh, uh, 
disturbed would cause a log above the trap to release, fall down on the pig, and trap it inside of the, of the uh, trap. And would hold it there live for a couple of days while the guy was out doing other things, hunting, and eventually he would come back and find, oh, hey, here's a, a live pig trapped in my thing, in my, in my trap, and uh, I, he's still perfectly fine. He hasn't rotted because uh, he choked to death. A very sophisticated kind of way to catch your dinner and hold it live till you come back and pick it up. Now, is that a mark of savagery? Sounds fairly sophisticated to me. Well, it's not very sophisticated of, at least for the one young man that I know who set one of these things, came to check his trap just in time to see a little, a pig with a, with a four or five piglets making its way into the trap. And he got so excited, see, that he gave his position away and the pig started to run away. So he decided he would chase the, uh, the little piglets into the trap, see, at least try to catch them. So he chased them all into the trap only to discover that they could run through the other side. And so he dived into the trap, see, to grab the last one, only to set the trap off and pin himself in there and had to lay there see, for two days <laughs> <laughs> until somebody came and said, what are you doing in there? And uh, let him up. Well, um, sophisticated tools. How do we determine what are sophisticated tools and what are not. We're going to stop and take a break here. We're going to come back to a discussion of Lewis Henry Morgan as well as the other positions, but let's take our break, get refreshed, come back, and we will talk about some of his other fallacies as he tried to develop his theory. The second instrument that uh, Morgan used to measure the progress of civilization or society was what he called social organization. The manner in which cultures would organize themselves around uh, families in particular. And he came to the conclusion out of uh, logic that if uh, we had emerged from animal stage to human stage that we could look to animal life as some kind of an indication of what human society must have been like at the very earliest stages. And so if we would look at a colony of monkeys, for instance, or at a group of apes, that uh, those apes, their lifestyle would be an indication of uh, the lifestyle of the first human beings. So uh, he came to the conclusion that early humans must have lived communally. In other words, uh, there'd be a whole colony of, or small colony, but a whole colony of men and women, and uh, nobody would have a husband or a wife. The, uh, the men would just uh, have relationships with any woman that they want. The women would have relations with whatever men that they wanted, and uh, children would just be born willy-nilly, and uh, children would have the foggiest clue who was their father, because mother had many lovers. Well, uh, this animal-like existence, if this was really true of what human society was like in its early stages, then the emergence from savagery to, uh, to barbarism must be marked by some kind of the emergence of the family. And with the emergence of the family, there would come uh, polygamy. And perhaps with the emergence of polygamy, you would also get the emergence of matrilineality. Because children wouldn't know who their father was, because after all, mother slept with all the men in the tribe, then uh, they would have to indicate their parenthood by their mother, who they would know. So children would then become matrilineal. They would take their identity through their mother's line because that was certain. So to him, Metrilineality was just one of those progressive kinds of things until ultimately we get to civilization where we all know who father is because we're monogamous. Mother, of course, has only one consort to live with, to bear children by, etc., etc. So uh, they sent out their, uh, their uh, anthropologists looking for signs of 
uh, uh, group communal living. You know what they discovered? Not one culture has ever been found in which a, the nuclear family is not a core component of the culture, in which people, men, will commit themselves to a definite woman and that they will, they will take the, uh, some form of marital obligation upon themselves. Now, they, those marital obligations will vary uh, through cultures, but there is no culture in all of recorded history in which communal living has ever been practiced, with one exception. A number of social scientists have tried what we call utopian societies in the 19th and 20th century where they thought that the way to get rid of all of this uh, uh, selfishness, this conflict, this competition was to live in a communal society where everybody owned everything equally so there would be no need to compete including the abolishment of, of uh, possessiveness toward men and women so that you couldn't have your own wife so that people could uh, live this communal lifestyle and copulate as they want to. Well, none of these have ever lasted beyond a generation or two. That kind of lifestyle simply will not sustain itself. So uh, they went out looking for simple social organization in cultures. And they sent anthropologists after anthropologists to examine the lifestyle of the Australian Aborigines. You know what they discovered? The Australian Aborigines have very complex social organization in terms of determining who's related to who. And they know who's related to who. There are no orphans. There are no children who, who have uh, no idea of what their connectedness is to the rest of the society. And they have these very, very complex webs of social relationships by which people know who they are. So the most simple cultures who were supposed to have no social organization turned out to have very complex systems of organizing their kinship, their families, and their clans. Well, he also chose language. Language as a means whereby <coughs> we could discover the um, uh, simplest, most savage peoples. The savage peoples should have a simple language. After all, monkeys communicate through uh, squeals, snorts, bluffing, scratching, tearing things up. Uh, but they have a very simple language. Sophisticated, civilized man has large dictionaries. So there must be some kind of progress. Well, uh, they came to the conclusion that if they could find very, very uh, uh, uncontaminated language groups, that they would find just the rudimentary basis of language. You know, me, hungry, food, cold. No, like you, you know, simple language. Right? You, bad, me, good, this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, um, so they went looking. Well, let me tell you how this works out. Have any of you, have any of you been to the movies and seen that, uh, that movie that came out? It came out years ago. It's, it's, it's played on TV a few times, usually on Saturday afternoon matinees because nobody else wants to watch it. But, <laughs> but it's a movie called Quest for Fire. Have any of you ever seen the movie Quest for Fire? It's, it's one of these uh, Stone Age uh, uh, comedies, uh, but uh, it's the story of, of supposedly a, a, a caveman group, and these two jerker, jokers are, uh, are supposed to be uh, watching the fire, and they fall asleep, and the fire goes <coughs> out, and now they don't have fire to cook their food, and they haven't yet learned how to, how to make flint and stone, so, uh, so everybody's all angry at these two guys for allowing the fire to go out, so they, they drive them out to go get uh, fire. And so they throw stones at them, drive them out, and off they go looking for fire. And ultimately they find a place where uh, where lightning is struck in a fire and they get a fire brand and they get fire again and then they have to make their way back to their to their people. But in the process they have to fight off all these uh, these uh, prehistoric animals, they have to fight off all of these other uh, bands of, uh, of folk who are uh, growling around and, and, uh, and uh, uh, living in a kind of a bestial lifestyle. But the marvelous thing about the whole movie is it's two hours long. There's not a word spoken to the whole movie. 
They grunt and groan through the whole movie, see? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I mean, they really do all this jerky stuff, but this is supposed to be a serious representation of what life was like for cavemen, see? Well, is that really what happened? See, has there ever been a time in the history of the human race when we didn't have language? Now, I don't know about you, but I feel very comfortable with a, uh, with a rather literal understanding of Genesis 1 and 2. All right? And you can do what you want with it. I'm not forcing my opinion on you. But I feel real comfortable with the fact that God created Adam to have fellowship with him. And part of having fellowship was the ability to communicate. And one of the interesting things that Adam does is he's given the commission by God to go out and name all the animals. Uh, it seems to me he's got language. <laughs> and he doesn't even have a wife at this point. It's just Adam, God, and the zebras. <laughs> and all the other animals. And he's out there and he's naming them all off and he's watching the goats jump up and down and, he, and he's watching the elephants waddle by with their big long trunks. And, you know, and he's having a marvelous day naming all the animals and using his ability for language. But then he, this profound sadness falls on the man because he sees that all the animals have a mate and he doesn't. Now, you know, this, it's, a, it's a very poignant time in creation and I see this as being, as being uh, uh, marvelously indicative of the fact that there never was a time when mankind did not have language and when and when that profound sadness fell upon Adam, God said, I'm going to solve your problem, Adam. I'm going to give you a help me. And he puts him into a deep sleep, you know, pulls a rib out of him, fashions it into a woman. And Adam wakes up from his deep sleep. And for joy, for joy, here is a woman. A help me just for him. And what does he do? <coughs> you know, does he grunt at her? No. <laughs> he says, this is woman from the womb. See? He, gives her, he gives her a name. I mean, he's talking. He's communicating. Something is happening <coughs> here. See? And they enter into the most profound communication one with the other. See? I think I think this whole idea is, is kind of screwy. But what did the anthropologists find? Well, they sent out anthropologists to check out some of the most primitive languages of the world. And you know what they found? Primitive languages are not the simplest languages of the world. As a matter of fact, we had the privilege of making contact with a couple of groups in the highlands of New Guinea who had been totally uncontacted by the outside world. They had an uncontaminated language, a language that was very, very ancient. As a matter of fact, the language of the people that we served with was what we called the Proto-Austronesian family of languages. Now, Proto-Austronesian, the languages in the South Pacific are the Austronesian family of languages. Proto-Austronesian are the languages that came into the South Pacific long before the present day languages. They are the most ancient languages in the South Pacific. And I was assigned to, to work with a group of people with this very, very ancient language. Ah, piece of cake. You ought to be able to learn that in a couple of weeks, right? Wrong. It was horrendously complex. It was a language in which, in which the verb has to come at the end of the sentence. And so if I was going to say something in Donnie, I would have to fashion my sentence uh, in the following manner. Tonight, in this building, in front of 25 students, a lecture on anthropological theory I will give. The verb has to be at the end. And the verb has to carry so much information. It has to carry who is doing it, who is being done to, the timing of that, and there are seven time or mood uh, tenses that have to be have to be conjugated. The manner in which the the activity is being done, and so a small little verb with only two letters, to, 
will all of a sudden become very, very long because it has to carry upwards to 2,000 different conjugations on the verb to indicate the mode of that behavior, who's doing it, time, all that sort of stuff. And so, toli andre, long word, see. Uh, edit nambu, see. from a little er. And you have to add all this other stuff on to tell who's doing it, who's doing it to. See. 2,000 conjugations that go on a verb in order to specify what is happening. A simple language? Absolutely not. Just to the north of us, there was the Eyal language. The Eyal language was tonal. A Wycliffe couple, uh, actually a Wycliffe team, because it wasn't a couple, it was two, uh, two single uh, women translators who were assigned to the Eyal language. They started doing the, the language analysis. We knew that it was a tonal language. They went to work on it. After several years of work, they discovered that the language had at least nine separate tones. That means that every letter, E, could be said upwards to nine different ways. E, 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 E. E, E. Yeah. Nine different ways. And then you put A ah with it. Ah, 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 ah. Ah, ah, ah. And then ooh, see? Ooh, ooh, yeah. You got the picture. <laughs> yow, yow, yow. All of those are different words. See? How do you write a language like that? You put E, A, U. It could be 10 different words. You have to put a number next to the E. E1, A3, U4. And then you have to assign a scale to each one of those numbers. And you know, once they did that, People said, oh yeah, we can read that, that's no problem. E, 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 one, two, three, line it all out there. So they could read it. They don't read the numbers, of course, but the numbers would tell them what the pitch was, and they, could re they started reading fluently as soon as they figured out a way to indicate the tonal system. The New Testament is now being translated into Eau. You'd have a hard time reading it. Right? <laughs> because you've got to keep going all up and down the scale. Simple language, right? These are savage people, right? Wrong. See? Savage is not simple. And this was one of the things that, that the evidence ultimately discovered. Then when it came to religion, religion was supposed to be, again, a, an example of how people move from... from the simple to the complex. And so the simple cultures, the savage cultures, what must their religion look like? Well, undoubtedly, these people would have a belief in which the whole world is filled with spooky ghosts, see, disembodied souls. Rocks move because they have spirits in them. Trees blow in the wind because they have their own souls. See? And so, they, so they, they, they created a whole religious system called animism. And said, savages have animism. Barbar barbarism? Well, they're the polytheist. See, those, those spooky ghosts that are hanging around in nature, all of a sudden they become minor gods fighting for control of the universe. But civilized people, well, we've got monotheism, see. We'll move from animism to polytheism to monotheism, see. We're the most sophisticated. Well, they went out to look at these simple little superstitious systems. Well, once again, see, I had to study one of these simple religions. See. And I discovered that it was a very complex belief system. And people have been saying for years that the religious beliefs of these people were all very pragmatic, unsystematic, unorganized. It was just a collection of random thoughts. There was no way that you could organize it. So we played with it, and we played with it, and we played with it. And after 20 years, we finally got it where we could understand it. And we discovered it was beautifully symmetrical. You'll read all about it when you read, when you read the ethnography on that particular chapter, when you come to the cosmology. See, it, all, it breaks down into nice little pairs, and ultimately you get all of these categories in which every spirit 
falls into a distinctive category. See? It was far more complex than anything that had been previously suggested might be possible for people who are supposed to be limited to savage thinking. Well, what happens when you, when you, when you engage in this kind of theoretical uh, postulation? Well, you come up to the conclusion, see, that, that if you've got savage people and you've got barbaric people and you've got, you've got civilized people, then you have to ask yourself the question, well, uh, if that's the case, how come this span of difference between civilized people who are living in cities and got electricity and talk on telephones and you've got other folk banging drums, sending drum messages, see? Uh, so you begin to ask some significant questions. You have to ask yourself, well, is it because they're mentally deficient? See? Is there something wrong with their brains of, of uh, people who live in Africa or in the Australian outback or in the jungles of South America? And so they sent out see, all kinds of researchers to try to check and see whether there was something wrong with their thinking, see, whether there was a, a breakdown in their mental processes, whether they couldn't reason the same way that civilized people reason. See. You know what they discovered? <coughs> they don't think any differently <coughs> than anybody else in the world. They had to ask the question, are they biologically inferior? See. Is there something wrong with them? That they are, that they are, that they don't have the capabilities of development such as we have. Are they running around uh, sort of, uh, sort of as a, as a species of ape? See? As a matter of fact, that would raise the very next question. See, are some of them subhuman? Are they not really humans at all? Are they some sort of break-off group from the evolutionary tree? You know, down here we start moving our way up through the evolutionary tree and, and we got monkeys off on this side and we've got uh, African natives on this side and Aborigines as a, as a break-off from them. And then at the very top we have the culturally, biologically, intellectually superior European races. The lovely Aryans, their blonde hair, six foot tall stature, long noses, thin little lips. Are we, the Aryan race, the very height of cultural and biological superiority? This is, a, this is a, a, an answer that a lot of cultures came up with. I mean, this was, this was the whole base of, of, uh, of the uh, Nazi Aryan supremacy. And it's not just limited to, to, uh, to Aryan supremacy. I, I, was, I was researching in a, in a library one time, came across a book entitled, Are the Irish Human Beings? <laughs> Are you Irish? Oh. With the red hair like that, you've got to be close to it. <laughs> Swedish. <laughs> Swedish. All right. Well, uh, anybody here Irish? Oh, okay. See, there was at one point in which, in which the British, the English, were really not convinced that the Irish were human beings. <laughs> ah, there's something got to be wrong with those Irish. I mean, they're subhuman. See, Don't marry your son or daughter to an Irishman or an Irish lass. I mean, after all, what kind of kids are you going to have? They'll hang from trees, you know? I mean, and, this, and this was taken as good scientific stuff. See? Oh. Well, it turns out to be nothing but, but racism. See? Absolutely nothing but racism. But it was seriously being propounded in the 19th century is serious social theory. And uh, it justified racial superiority. Well, for those who couldn't quite accept that, uh, they came to the conclusion that perhaps some cultures are just depraved. Perhaps they've got themselves so caught up in sinful lifestyle that they have degenerated down to the level of bestiality that it's only our moral superiority that allowed us to advance. And so there was a, this moral superiority, this attitude that, was, that took place that allowed Europeans to carve up the whole of the world into colonies. You see, because the next possible solution to all of these questions about why 
some cultures are more advanced than others, was to say, well, maybe it's just because they're deprived. You know what I mean by deprived? They just haven't had any exposure to the good teachings of civilization. They're ignorant. They're morally reprobate. They're biologically inferior. They're culturally uh, uh, backward. What we've got to do is we've got to go in and straighten them out. And so the whole concept of the white man's burden We've got to go in and straighten out the whole world. And that was the whole basis for colonialism. This superior attitude that was based on this kind of thinking. Well, it was, it was an ugly, an ugly uh, uh, period in the history of anthropological theory. And it had to be totally devastated. And it was. It's been totally devastated. And, uh, and no research has been able to justify any of these approaches. But I bring it up because, you see, it is still a theory that's not quite died because there is still the belief that somehow or another evolution as a biological paradigm continues to bleed over into anthropology and there is a still a firm conviction that somehow or another we have evolved. It's just that it's far more complex of a process than we've originally thought. And while we can make fun of Lewis Henry Morgan today, in point of fact, most anthropologists still buy into an evolutionary concept of how cultures have progressed. And that bias continues to show up in the literature. Well, we really need to move on. We need to move on to a second theory, and that is historical particularism. I hate these long terms, but we need to learn a few technical terms in the course. And historical particularism is the theory that has been attributed to an anthropologist by the name of Franz Boas. He is the father of American anthropology. I don't ask you to memorize a lot of names, but you really ought to know Franz Boas, father of American anthropology. I can almost guarantee that's going to show up on the test. Uh, because, after all, you ought to know at least one figure. And his influence carries well into the present. He came to the conclusion that cultures are the product not of evolution, but are the product of their own unique historical and particular circumstances. That's where the term historical particularism comes from. Their own particular histories that should be studied like works of art and for the sake of their own worthiness. So every culture is a unique painting, if you would, that needs to be examined. And so uh, Franz Boas decided that the best way to understand a culture was to forget this uh, uh, comparing it to other cultures, but let's simply go in and discover everything we can about it. Let's fall completely in love with this culture, and let's conduct what he called rigorous descriptions or rigorous ethnographies of a culture. So an ethnography is a systematic description of a culture. And he said, do rigorous ethnographies. Record everything they do. And Franz Boas went into the uh, Northwest tribes up in Oregon, Washington area, and, uh, and he wrote prolific notes. I mean, there are whole shelves of, of stuff that he wrote. If you want a blueberry recipe from, from the Northwest Indians, he's got blueberry recipes. See, He recorded everything. And uh, he believed that this was the prime contribution that anthropologists could give. He also came to the conclusion that in addition to conducting these rigorous ethnographies in which you would do systematic analysis, that it was time for anthropologists to suspend their personal moral judgments about cultures. He said, don't worry about uh, why they do what they do or the moral uh, condition of what they do. Just describe it. See? Don't worry if they eat their food raw or cooked. See? Don't worry about whether they make women bring the firewood in or whether men bring in the firewood. Don't worry about the division of labor. Just record it. Don't conclude that pride wealth is wrong simply because it puts an onerous 
responsibility upon the grooms. Just record the data. Suspend your personal moral judgments. Now, he is, of course, the father of cultural relativism See, that we studied last time. It was Franz Boas who was the strongest proponent of this particular point of view. He said the goal of anthropological inquiry should be for the anthropologist to be able to understand a culture as if he were an insider. We need to be able to see culture through the same lens, the same perception as the people of a culture. This becomes the insider's point of view, not the outsider's point of view. This ought to be the goal of anthropological inquiry. Well, it was a marvelous breakthrough. See. And uh, quite frankly, I was, I was inspired by Franz Boas. And one of my conclusions as I was studying anthropological theory was, I want to know Donny culture as much as I can possibly come to know it, and I want to be able to think and to see life as much as it is possible for an outsider to do through the perspective of an insider, of a Donny. I want to become a Donny. You know what? That's the incarnational principle. Now, it's more idealistic than it is real because we can never totally shed what we are. Only Jesus Christ could give up his godhood and become truly man. The rest of us don't have that great ability. But you know what? We can approach it. See, We can attempt to become as much as possible like they are. To be able to travel in their shoes, or if they don't have shoes, in their gourds. Mm -hmm. And to be able to think and to see life as they do. Well, um, a third anthropological theory that came along was one that was that has come into the literature and under the name of functionalism. It was propounded by a man by the name of Bronislaw Malinowski. He studied in the Trobrian Islands off of the coast of New Guinea. And Malinowski came to the conclusion that culture is the product of men's attempts to meet biological, psychological, and social needs. That mankind has certain basic fundamental needs which the whole point of, of social organization is to, is to fulfill and satisfy those needs. So his entire enterprise is the satisfaction of his survival needs. Now, his anthropological theory resonates very closely with what later became a psychological theory. And I'm going to compare it to the psychological theory because the psychologist who picked up on this concept was a fellow by the name of Maslow. Have any of you heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? All right. Let's look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow said that there's a hierarchy of needs in which there is on the bottom of the pyramid the physiological needs. Once the physiological needs have been met, then you move to the security needs. After the security needs, there's the reproductive needs. After reproductive needs, you come to aesthetic needs. And ultimately, you come to the highest level, which would be meaning needs. Now, Malinowski bought into this kind of an of a, uh, of a, uh, approach to the study of culture. And he said, what we need to do is examine how every practice that a people engage in in their culture and to see how it fits into satisfying the basic fundamental needs of the members of the society. That's why it's called functionalism. How does it function to satisfy the needs of the members of the society? Well, a uh, marvelous fresh idea. And a lot of folk came to the conclusion that this was, that this was uh, a, a, a great way to indicate the priorities that cultures give and to show how they would fit together into a nice, neat system. And it became then a very popular uh, adaptation that missionaries were able to pick up and say, OK, we want to see how these are fulfilling human needs. And we want to step in and help to fulfill those needs by bringing alternative ways to satisfy those needs and in ways that are very, very Christian. Well, 
we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But here was a, a, a new approach to doing anthropological inquiry. Well, there are those who were not happy with Malinowski or with Boaz or with Morgan. They didn't completely throw them out, but they felt that they didn't have a full comprehension of what was happening. So along comes the perspective that we call cultural materialism. And Marvin Harris, a very popular contemporary anthropologist, espouses this point of view. He's written some marvelous uh, anthropology textbooks. I have used this textbook in uh, other places when I was teaching, uh, particularly for Golden Gate uh, University. And it, uh, marvelous, good stuff. He's a, he's a great writer. But uh, Marvin Harris see, comes to the conclusion that culture is humanity's response to the ecological constraints of the environment. And he comes to the conclusion that culture builds around the limitations that are placed upon it by the ecology. Let me give you an example. Um, in India. In India, you have uh, sacred cows. What do you do with those sacred cows? Why are people who are starving to death allowing cows to run around without food? Well, he goes in and he, as part of his research strategy, carefully examines the ecological conditions that interact with human beings. And he looked at the interaction between Indians in South India and the ecology and says, yes, food is very scarce. How can they get more food? Can they get more food by killing cows and eating them? And he said, no. If you take a close look at the ecology of, of the Indian subcontinent, what you'll discover is that cows are great producers. What are they great producers of? Cow pies. You know, those big <laughs> things that you don't want to step in when you're going through a pasture. See. So uh, they're great manure producers. See. As a matter of fact, they're superior manure producers. And if you take that manure and put it on your fields, you can produce far more grain with fertilized fields, and you can up food production very, very dramatically by using cows as manure producers rather than as beef. As a matter of fact, you will get far more food and nutrition off of a field of grain that is producing healthy uh, and productively as a result of artificial uh, manure uh, or uh, fertilization from manure than you will from killing the cow. So he said they quickly discovered that they would get more food this way, so they made the cow sacred. That protects them allows them to produce manure, and now we have a, a special category of people who go around collecting all this manure to ensure that there's enough food to eat. We now have the key to understanding the sacred cow phenomenon in India. It's an ecological decision. Well, with this revelation, Marvin Harris goes on to examine cultures all around the world, including why pigs are sacred, or impure, I should say, why pigs are impure, why cows are sacred, why the New Guinea peoples have massive festivals every five years. Because again, it's an ecological constraint. You can't take care of pigs ad infinitum. You've got to carry them, kill them off. And so the best way to kill them off is to have a massive feast in which everybody enjoys uh, a, uh, a social festival in which they can make peace. Well. This is, again, one more desperate attempt to understand the riddle of culture. And that's a term see, that Marvin Harris uses, the riddle of culture. In talking about the riddle of culture, he is convinced that ecological considerations must take precedence. Well, Marvin Harris's nemesis is Napoleon Shagnon. And Napoleon Shagnon has taken a different perspective. Napoleon Shagnon has taken the perspective that it's really sociobiology that is the key to understanding culture. 
Napoleon Chagnon comes to the conclusion, along with others, but he's just one of the leaders, comes to the conclusion that culture is humanity's attempt to ensure the survival through reproductive preferences of the fittest human beings. We're going to go all the way back to Darwin's theory of evolution, but we're going to modify it because you see Darwin's theory of evolution has been modified and changed over the, over the years. Massive amounts of research have been done and along come the sociologists who are trying to understand the biological role and particularly human reproduction. And the social biologists come to the conclusion that, listen, every culture has to ensure the survival of its most promising members. Therefore, as part of its cultural pattern of existence, they will grant certain privileges to those individuals who are the most successful, who have the most promise for success in the culture, and these are the people who are given access to the wealth of the tribe or the culture. They are given the authority and the prestige, but more importantly, they are given access to the most reproductive, delightful women in the tribe to be their mates, to have more children, to ensure the, the, the protection or the reproduction of the tribe. And so he states that it is the goal of every anthropological study to examine every cultural practice to see how it will affect reproductive behavior. And out of this, we will discover then who gets the most favored positions in culture. Now, there's an awful lot of good stuff in Napoleon Chagnon's approach. We're going to talk about this when we talk about polygamy, but uh, why is it that some women want to enter into a household in which they would be a second or a third or a fourth wife? What kind of man would attract that kind of woman? And one of the things that Napoleon Chagnon has done has been to show that it's the best hunters the best providers who are able to attract the most women. Why? Because these women wanted to be in relationship to somebody who can ensure that they have food, who can ensure that their children will be taken care of, who will ensure that they are good, faithful uh, providers and family men. See? And so the rewards go to the most promising men. And men will, will be attracted to the most promising women. Now, I read an interesting article in Reader's Digest just a few months ago. Is there a universal standard of beauty? And the conclusion of a number of social biologists is, yes, there is a universal standard of beauty. Now, I'm not sure I want to go into all of this because you'll think I'm a dirty old man. See? And you're already going to come to that conclusion before this course is over. But... Um, but what do, what do guys like in a woman? Well, uh, full lips is kind of a characteristic that uh, men attribute as being beautiful. See, narrow little lips. Doesn't really attract a lot of men, but, but nice full lips. And, uh, and so, uh, <coughs> so uh, what's so sexy about full lips? Well, according to this article, full lips are the sign of the presence of certain kinds of, of uh, uh, chemicals that are present in the woman's body that will allow her to be more successful in bearing children. Yeah, I know, sounds hokey, but that's what they argue. And so men over the years have discovered that women with big lips, see, are more successful producers of children, so that's become a sign of beauty, along with other marks like, you know, healthy hips and healthy other things that uh, are <laughs> part of childbearing, see. And so this is the conclusion that really what men are looking for in beauty are women who will be great reproducers of kids, see. 
and that this has become then uh, ingrained in us. And so we men to go looking for women who will have lots of healthy children. Well, whether you agree with them or not, they are doing this kind of research and trying to find out whether there is some kind of relationship between reproduction, reproductive success, and social organization. There is still a, another point of view, and that is a point of view that has been dubbed interpretive anthropology, and a anthropologist by the name of Clifford Geertz is one of the leading proponents of this particular point of view. Clifford Geertz is, a, is alive today, continues to lecture, continues to teach, and Clifford Geertz has come to the conclusion that we really need to take an entirely different approach to the understanding of culture. Culture is the product of human perceptions. It is a human interpretation of the world. It can only be understood by interpretive analysis. People don't really know what the world is truly like, they can only interpret what they believe to be the nature of the world. And so uh, they look at the world and they organize it according to certain kinds of perceptions. For instance, for instance, the Donnie that I worked with would look up at the sky okay, and they would see uh, the clouds forming and reforming. Now they had no idea what was causing the clouds to form and reform. But there were times when the wind would scatter the clouds into a pattern, into a formation that looked very much like a garden. And so they would tell me, it looks like the little people in the sky are gardening today. And I'd look up and sure enough, you could see the cloud patterns looking like gardens. And I'd say, oh, the little people. Yes, of course, the little people in the sky, they're gardening today. Yes, I can see that. I said, uh, are they friends? Are they good? Oh, no, 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 no. They, they used to live down here. We drove them up into the sky because they were stealing our potatoes. And they're not really at all happy with us. As a matter of fact, when they really don't like us, they get their women to urinate on us. <laughs> and that's what causes rain. All of a sudden now, we've got an explanation for clouds and rain based on an interpretation. And Clifford Geertz says, that's what life is all about. What we need to do is understand people's interpretations. And so, uh, so let's go out there and let's look at culture. Let's analyze it in terms of meaning and purpose. As that meaning and purpose is assigned to life and to behaviors. We don't need to try to explain it. We don't need to be looking like Napoleon Shagnon does at the sociobiological causes. We don't need to be looking at the ecological uh, consequences. What we need to be looking at is what do people think is real? What purpose do they assign to it? That's what's significant about culture. So look at it in terms of, in the same manner, in the same manner in which you would go to, a, to a, an art museum and look at a painting and say, what do you see? Hmm. What I see, I see, I see a very angry man lashing out. No, no, I see, I see a man who's hurt and he's crying out in pain. Oh, that's interesting. See, you ever been to one of those art museums where you have to you have to interpret what the artist is saying? I've been to a few. I've taken my share of art appreciation classes, you know, and been there. And uh, and so I turned to a uh, an art teacher one day. I said, "What do you see in that picture?" And he said, "What do you see?" So I told him what I saw, and he says, oh, oh, that's wonderful. Let me go get the artist. And he brought the artist over and says, tell him what you just told me. So I told him what I saw in the picture, you know. And his eyes lit up, and he said, oh, thank you, thank you. That's so marvelous. I said, so what did you want it to represent? He said, that doesn't matter. 
What I want to do is evoke feeling in you, and you've done it, and I feel so good. Now you can see why they get away with wearing turtleneck sweaters see, instead of ties. See. They get excited about the most unusual things. Well, but that, you see, that's what the art was supposed to do. And, and along comes Clifford Geertsen, he says, listen, what we need to do see, is see culture through the eyes of people who give it meaning. See, we need to do what he calls thick description. See. Get the insider's point of view and forget about all this other explanation. Well, what is our response to these six different uh, theories? See, we've got all these perspectives. We've got these different approaches. See. Which one is the right one? You know what? If you're going to ask the question, which one is the right theory, you're probably in the wrong class. Probably ought to send you across the other side of the campus. See. It, because it's the philosophers and the theologians who've got the right answers. See. Here, what we've got are a whole set of tools. We've got six different tools that we can use to analyze culture. And do you want to know something? Every tool has a different task. And none of them is going to be right or wrong unless we try to make that theory do more than it can possibly do. Unless we set up a wrong theoretical approach. What we need to do is bring a Christian perspective to each one of these. And do you know what we're going to discover? We're going to discover that we can do a marvelous task of understanding culture. One of the first things I had to learn when I went overseas was we could not buy our meat in nice little cellophane wrapped packages in the grocery store. We had to buy our meat still on the hoof. Yeah, okay. $50 for your pig. Right. You got it. I now have a pig. <laughs> Somehow or another, I have to get that oinker <laughs> onto my table. And so I quickly learned how to brain them, how to skin them, how to clean them out, and how to get pork chops, spare ribs, hams, and all other kinds of meats off of them. See, I learned how to butcher. And, and I felt pretty good about it. You know, I was butchering away. I've got my big old Bowie knife, you know, and I'm slicing away, and I'm having a grand time. But it's taking, you know, it takes quite a while to clean out a pig. But I was doing it. And then we had a, a missionary show up who had been a professional butcher when he, before he came to the mission field. And he became then the official butcher for a conference. And all of us missionaries got together. And we all went down to see how he would do a pig, professional style, you know, learn a few tricks. And he came out, oh, yes. And he pulled out his apron, and he put his apron on. And his apron was filled with all kinds of knives. He must have had a dozen knives, all in their special little pockets. See? Wow, you know, my little Bowie knife. He's got this long, skinny, boning knife. See? He's got the big, broad knives. He's got the, oh, yeah. He had a knife for every purpose. Every knife had its special little task that it could do. And next thing you know, see? he's hit the juggler vein first try. You know, I mean, I'm, when I tried to do the juggler, I had to cut the whole throat, you know. But first little stab with the right knife, started to bleed that, that, that uh, pig out. Next thing you know, he's slicing and dicing. And in, uh, in 20 minutes, he's got all the cuts laid out there in a task that would have taken me three hours. But he had the right tools. And he knew how to use them. You know what? When we have the right tools, and when we use the right means for analyzing. We can come up with marvelous insights that would otherwise have taken us forever to learn. And one of the things that I became very, very impressed with was a fellow by the name of Leopold Pospisil came to Irian Jaya. He spent two years studying the Kapauku culture. He knew what questions to ask. He knew where to get his data. And he went home with shelfuls of data. And he wrote at least six or seven books on Kapoku culture. 
And he discovered in the course of two years a far greater understanding of Kapoku culture than any of us who had been missionaries for years had been able to accomplish. You know why? Because he knew what questions to ask. He knew how to analyze it. He knew how to bring it together into a systematic understanding. And the rest of us profited immensely. And I said to myself, we can do that. We can get those tools and we can study culture. So, as evangelicals, we come to a couple of responses. First of all, we must not uncritically accept any one theory. We want to critically look at every theory, take out of them what is best, take out of them what we can use, and discard the rest. But we want to learn the tools that are available to us in anthropological theory. The second point that we want to make is that we must acknowledge in the course of our understanding that mankind is God's creation. And that mankind has been given a very special place in creation. Mankind has been discharged with the ability to be in fellowship with one another and with God. And that we must look at culture in respect to relationships to God and in respect to the fracturing of relationships with God as a result of first sin, which will impact all of our relationships to our ecology, to one another, and to our God. So we look at anthropological theory from the perspective of man with purpose and with spiritual uh, responsibility. And the third point that we would want to make is that culture can be distorted, but it can also be transformed. Cultures are constantly changing. Some cultures are sick cultures. A very famous anthropologist has written a book called Sick Cultures. Some cultures are sick. Some are self-destructing. Some are passing out of existence. Some are preying on other cultures. And we recognize that. And we do not accept that they have a legitimate right in the same sense that other cultures that may be growing, vibrant, healthy, productive cultures. We have these two kinds sick cultures, the productive cultures, whatever they may be, we recognize that under the impact of the teaching of the Word of God, every culture has the capability of being transformed, of entering into a set of behavioral guidelines that will allow that particular people to live in fellowship with God, with the creator of the universe. That is part of what we want to do as we look at the whole context of culture. We want to look at these theories. We want to apply evangelical perspectives. And then we want to take those tools to help us turn to people and say, you too can live for Jesus Christ within the confines of your culture. And these are some of the things that we're going to be reflecting on during the next several weeks as we look at the particular cultural institutions. We finish the theoretical discussion. We finished the kind of the introductory stuff. Now we want to start working our way through the various cultural institutions and that will be the task ahead of us. So, we are done for the night. Trust that you will have a marvelous a week ahead and that you will uh, enjoy the reading from the text as we continue to make our way into uh, the rest of our cultural studies. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.